Hello and welcome back to my channel and part seven of my series, Living with the Tao Tao. If you're new to this series, let me get you caught up. I purchased the most hated scooter on the internet and made it my daily means of transportation in order to find out if it really is unreliable or if it just has unreliable owners. I've been keeping a comprehensive trip log, service notes, and health report in a Google spreadsheet that I've shared with you in this video's description. So I finally did it. I crossed 1,000 miles on this $750 scooter. For reference, that's the same as traveling from Missoula, Montana to Billings, Montana, back to Missoula, Montana, and then back to Billings, Montana. Or for my viewers who are less familiar with Montana geography, that's the same distance that Vanessa Carlton will walk just to see you tonight. Now I've got a lot to say about this little scoot, so let's get started. So before we start in on this review, we need to talk about what this scooter was intended to be. This scooter was sold here and intended to fall within the US 50cc scooter or moped classifications. Now these classifications vary from state to state, but let me just tell you what the state of Texas defines as a moped. Texas classifies mopeds as motor-driven, two-wheeled vehicles which cannot surpass the speed of 30 miles per hour when driven in a straight line for one mile. The state of Texas also defines mopeds as motor-powered cycles which do not exceed 50 cc's in piston displacement. Texas laws state that a moped is a motor-powered cycle that does not require manual gear changes. The maximum power produced by a cycle legally recognized as a moped in Texas is two brake horsepower. Two-wheeled vehicles which exceed these values are automatically classified as motorcycles in Texas. Now I'm not going to go state by state and explain the intricacies of each one's laws because you get the general idea. But I will note that in some states a moped does not require a motorcycle endorsement on your driver's license. And in fact, in some states, a moped does not require a driver's license at all. So this scooter, by design, was supposed to be a slow and affordable means of transportation. So I won't be docking it for things like having a low top speed or being underpowered. Which it has a very low top speed, and it is very underpowered. Now I'm going to break my review down into different sections so we can cover different parts of this scooter individually. We're going to cover the powertrain, which includes the engine and transmission, the chassis, which includes the frame, the suspension, and the brakes. We're going to cover rider comfort. We're going to cover the scooter's features and its usability. And last of all, styling. And I'm going to use a scale of zero to five stars. After we finish with the component reviews of this bike, I'm going to give you my overall opinion on what it's like to actually use this bike as my daily means of transportation. Or, in other words, what it's like to be living with a Tao Let's start with the engine and transmission. Now, of course, this little scooter uses the 50cc 139QMB GY6 engine platform. And it certainly delivers in the cannot exceed 30 miles per hour in under a mile category. Now, I know these little motors can be tuned up to perform a lot better than this one is, but I'm not reviewing my skills as a technician or as a scooter tuner, I'm reviewing this scooter as it is delivered. Now this engine really is lacking in low end torque. A bone stock Honda Ruckus, which by no means is a fast scooter, just blows the doors off this thing from stoplight to stoplight. The lack of torque is most noticeable when you're accelerating from a stop on a slight incline. At that point you basically have to kind of flintstone yourself along just to get this thing running. And once it picks up some speed and the transmission has a chance to shift, it actually does okay. That being said, I am thoroughly impressed with the initial tune on this transmission. I mean, once you get that initial momentum out of the way, it really shifts nicely. 
the engine RPMs climb right up into the power band and they hold there while the scooter is accelerating. And if you get slowed down by, say, a hill or some gradual incline or a little bit of wind, the transmission does a pretty nice job of kicking down a gear and keeping the engine in its power band. Now, I've ridden a lot of scooters, and especially older scooters like the old Honda Elite 80 or even my old uh, Yamaha Riva 80. R.I.P. Um, did not do as good of a job of downshifting. The Riva especially would really bog on a hill. The fuel mileage is also pretty darn good as well. Now, I don't even operate this scooter in optimum conditions. My commute is pretty long. It has a lot of stretches at maximum speed, which is right around 34 miles an hour. It's pretty windy and there's a lot of hills. I'm sure if you were just putting this thing around a 25 mile an hour neighborhood, you could get well over 114 miles per gallon. And so far, I've had zero reliability issues with this power plant. Other than the stock tune on the carburetor is extremely lean, and it makes me very, very nervous. And the lean tune on this carburetor might not be the fault of the manufacturer, it might just be a way to regulate the speed of the bike. I'm gonna give the powertrain of this little Tau Tau ATM50 a three out of five stars. For scale, zero stars is I'd rather walk, and five stars is a perfect score for a comparable 50cc four-stroke air-cooled scooter. An example of a five-star powertrain in this category would be the latest iteration of the Vespa Sprint 50. The new electronic fuel-injected sprints have a very, very torquey low end and very smooth power delivery. Let's move on to the chassis. Now I've already had some issues with the steering bearings. They've loosened up on me twice. And that's not something an owner should really ever have to deal with. But it's also not something that can be fixed with some Loctite or a little extra torque on the jam nut. Usually, loose steering bearings this early on are indicative of poor quality bearings grinding slack into themselves or having the bearing races installed crooked from the factory. We won't really know until we pull it apart and examine it again. In addition to that, I have another handling issue. You see, when I make left hand turns, the center stand drags on the ground. And while that does make me feel like Kenny Roberts on my way to work, I am a little nervous that I'm losing my center stand one shaving at a time. I'm also worried that that dragging center stand is going to snag something one day and high side the bike and send me flying into a parked car or something like that. The suspension also feels like it's nearly maxed out at all times. Now granted I am a 220 pound rider, much bigger than the intended audience for this bike. But the manual states that the suspension max load is 167 kilograms, or 368 pounds. But it sure doesn't feel like it can handle much more than me. I can even feel the chassis flex a little bit when I go through bigger dips in the road. However, the chassis geometry is not too bad. The steering is pretty light and nimble. The scooter transitions from left to right turns pretty easily and it's very stable at low speeds. And it's even pretty stable at the upper thresholds of speeds that this scooter is capable of achieving. Last, I did have issues with the front brake. As you saw in my earlier videos, there was some sort of oil coating the brake rotor that I didn't know was on there and therefore didn't clean off the rotor as part of my PDI. This allowed oils to embed themselves into the brake pad, pretty much rendering the front brake useless. After cleaning the front rotor and brake pads, the front brake really was a lot more effective, but still not great. It's hard to put into words what great brakes really feel like, but it's something like this. When you're braking under pressure and you increase the pressure just the slightest amount, you feel that difference in the front wheel. With this scooter, I feel like the brakes are on, and if I increase the pressure a lot, it kind of changes how the scooter is braking.
but I really wouldn't have the confidence to take this thing on the racetrack like I did my Buddy 125. And of course, I have to bring up the fact that I've already had a front brake failure on this bike. As you saw in my last video, the front brake line was being scrubbed by the front tire and it compromised the line. Now I replaced that with a better than OEM part and it actually did improve the front brake feel. But that wasn't the way the bike was delivered to me, so I can't really include that improvement in the review. I give the chassis, suspension and brakes a one star out of five not only due to the failures I've already had, but also the flexing in the chassis really doesn't inspire confidence when you're riding this thing every day. For reference, a perfect five-star scooter in this category would be the latest generation of the Yamaha Zuma 50. Rider comfort is a combination of ride quality, rider position, and the layout of the controls. Now this is where this scooter really falls short. I get the feeling that this scooter was definitely designed for someone much shorter than me. Now granted I am 6'4 and bigger than the average rider, but I do ride a lot of scooters and most of the time my knee is not forced into the ignition key. Now I can slide further back on the seat, but that starts to position my shoulders and upper back in a position that becomes uncomfortable when riding for long periods of time. And because of the low top speed of the scooter, I do find myself riding for long periods of time. And speaking of the seat, the padding is extremely thin and the cheap construction of the seat makes me wonder if I'm going to wind up inside the bucket one of these days. Moving on to the hand controls, the levers feel pretty good in your hands, but the grips are this hard plasticky rubber and they're a little slick and uncomfortable. And the switches have that certain feel that makes you wonder if they're produced in the same factory that makes the Happy Meals toys. There also really isn't enough room for my feet on the floorboards. Now I'm willing to take part of the blame for that, but it is something to consider if you wear work boots on a regular basis like I do. And of course we need to talk about the ride quality, which is pretty harsh. Now as you're riding the scooter you kind of get bounced and jounced down the road and you really feel every pothole and divot. Now a lot of people will chalk this up to running 10 inch wheels and tires, but I will remind them that the Buddy series scooters, the Buddy 50, 125, Buddy 150, and the Honda Metropolitan also run 10 inch tires and they don't really have that same issue. I'm going to give this scooter a 1 out of 5 stars for rider comfort. It is a little bit better than walking, but it is far from perfect. For reference, a perfect score in rider comfort would go to something like the Piaggio Liberty 50. The Piaggio has a fantastic seat, an upright riding position, and the switches and grips feel great. We've arrived at the features and usability portion of the review. Now this is actually this scooter's strong suit. While the seat is very uncomfortable, it does uncover a capacious storage compartment. And this typically holds my rain suit, my work laptop, which I kind of have to put in there at an angle to get it to fit right, but it does hold in there pretty nicely, and any odds and ends I need to bring along with me. In addition to the under seat storage, the Tau Tau also features this handy rear trunk. And while it is very flimsy and cheaply made, and pretty much any key that you can fit in the slot will open the latch, it does do a nice job of holding my lunchbox and any spare tools and parts I want to bring along with me. Finally, let's talk about my favorite feature on this scooter, this front bin. Now I can throw my water bottle and my morning container of coffee in here and not worry about it bouncing around uncontained under the seat. Usability, however, is a bit of a touch and go subject. Now while this scooter really makes me dread my across town appointments or my longer commute, the intended user probably is some urban rider who doesn't have to deal with many hilly areas, bumpy streets, or roads with higher speed limits. 
in which case this thing is pretty dead on. It really does start right up, holds most of your stuff, and if you're not going far, you don't really notice how uncomfortable it is. So I'm gonna have to give this thing a four out of five stars for features and usability. For reference, a perfect score in this category would be the Genuine Buddy 50, or for my viewers outside of the United States, the PGO Boo Boo 50, with of course the additional Buddy Bin. Now I'll keep the style rating portion of this video pretty short, because as my father likes to say, all your taste is in your mouth, meaning this sort of thing is pretty subjective. But I'm gonna have to give this thing a zero out of five stars for styling. And let me explain. Zero stars means I would rather not be seen than seen riding this scooter. Now part of that is my fault because I did order this paint combination on purpose. When they said gold was an option for paint, I thought it would be kind of flashy and sarcastic. But when it arrived and I uncrated it, it was this 90s Toyota Camry milk toast gold that definitely couldn't flash its way out of a dark room. But I think the biggest offenses to the eyes are committed by this insect head shaped headset and the bulbous trunk. Now, of course, I could remove the trunk, but then I lose the functionality of the scooter. And I could delete this headset and just run stock handlebars and a single headlight on the chest plate here, but then it's not really a Tau Tau 50 anymore. It's some sort of custom scooter. For reference, I would select something like the Vespa Sprint 50 Racing 60s edition for a perfect five out of five score in the style department. Now let's talk a little bit about what it's actually like to own and ride this scooter. Now this scooter had an initial purchase price of $769 with an additional $63.44 to be collected in tax. So the official price for this scooter to show up at my door was $832.44. Now, before my scooter had reached 1,000 miles, I had to do services like valve adjustments and oil changes, and the front brake line blew out, and I had to tighten the steering bearings. So that added an additional $50.08 in parts. And if I would have had all these repairs done at a local motorcycle shop, that would have cost me an additional $528 in labor. So that means the true cost of riding this scooter 1,000 miles was $1,410.52. Now, that is still pretty reasonable when you consider the initial purchase price of higher quality scooters being higher than $2,000. I think the closest scooter that would come close to that would be the Genuine Buddy 50, or once again, the PGO Boo Boo 50, because that has an initial purchase price of $1,999 US dollars, and because it has a two-stroke engine, it doesn't really need service before 1,000 miles. So, in that case, the scooter sort of really is good value, but that's also a discrepancy because I've had so many issues in the first thousand miles that have made me actually feel unsafe that I can't say it's good value when you factor in peace of mind. Now, I understand me riding this scooter in Austin, Texas is gonna be different than you guys riding your scooters wherever you ride but I'd like to share a few things with you. The first is the low top speed of the scooter coupled with how long it takes for me to reach that top speed really aggravates drivers behind me. And in Texas, at least, we have really aggressive drivers who like to yell and scream and throw things and try and uh, endanger your life with their vehicles. And I find myself feeling very unsafe on a regular basis. I've been yelled at and told to get in the bike lane. Um, I've had people try and run me off the road. I've had things thrown at me. I've been sworn at, um, which has made me feel like I don't want to continue this experiment. It doesn't feel worth my uh, mental anguish. In addition to that, this scooter breaking down so often in so many crucial areas like steering and brakes, 
um, also makes me a little bit worried for myself. If the steering bearings were to fail completely, or let's say the front brake line blew out without me knowing it, you know, I could have been seriously injured. And that's something that I have never really felt before on a scooter. And I, I kind of like to think about it this way. If you were in a tough spot and you bought a $750 car to get back and forth to work, you wouldn't trust it very much, but at least in the peak of that car's life, it was worth $15,000, $20,000. This scooter, brand new, was only worth $769. And that means that it's worth $769 and someone is still making a profit. The factory is making a profit and the importer is making a profit. Okay? So, when you start to factor in the components, it really starts to become scary. Consider this. How much would you pay for an engine and transmission that would reliably get you to work and back? You know, if it's going to be a 50cc air-cooled simple engine like this, you might think, oh, $300 is a fair price. Okay, and that's fair. But that's half the cost of the scooter. You still have to build a frame. You still have to have suspension. You still have to have DOT certified lighting. You still have to have braking system. You still have to have tires. You still have to have rubber floor mats and a seat that's covered in some sort of cheap vinyl stuff. You still have to have all the screws and hardware and you have to take it through emissions testing and DOT lighting testing and all those things to make it legal. And all those things added up it becomes really scary how cheap these components must be. And there goes my life, riding on these components every day. And it's hard for me to justify continuing this experiment knowing how much danger I'm in constantly. So that's been motivation for me to keep up on the upkeep. That's been motivation for me to not ride the scooter when it is dangerous. Um, but. I have to say, maybe when I started this experiment, my eyes were a little bigger than my stomach. Now, all that aside, I'm going to continue this experiment for a while. Um, I just want you guys to know where I'm at with this project. I want you guys to know that the main reason I'm doing this experiment is to collect the raw data. This is something I've actually wanted to know for years. While working in independent motorcycle shops, I literally fed myself for years putting these scooters back together, and I feel like I have a pretty good grasp. And I wanted to know, are they really bad or do they have bad owners? And I'm starting to feel like maybe I judge the owners a little too harshly. And if a professional technician has this much trouble keeping this thing on the road, I can't imagine what it would be like if you had limited financial resources or you had limited mechanical skills. I think these things would be great if you were just zipping up and down the neighborhood or you know going to the pool or you wanted to strap it to the back of your RV and putt around. I, I'm sure it's great for that. But as a viable means of daily transportation, I'd say the scooter is extremely subpar. It takes me so long to get anywhere around town and it stresses me out so much to do so. When I get home, I don't even want to make these videos, let alone wrench on the scooter some more. It's really been taking a toll on me mentally. So I'm not trying to create some sort of sob story, I just want you guys to know what it's actually like to live with this thing and to depend on it. That being said, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Make sure you ring the notification bell so you don't miss out any of my future foibles and follies living with this Tau Tau. And I will see you next time for my 2000 kilometer service.